Okay, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, welcome this morning to our Building Climate Resilience event. My name's Caroline Welsh. I'm on the board of the Birchip Cropping Group and really excited to have you all here today. It seems like this idea has been very, month, very many months in the making. First of all, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional, traditional custodians of the land, their rich cultural connection to country and pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. And we're sorry we weren't able to have someone from Burijigadjin come here today to do a proper welcome to country. Uh, to get the, de the uh, boring details out of the way, for those of you who uh, haven't been to Birchip before, very much welcome to people from, um, from all over the countryside, but the toilets are in the foyer uh, in front of me. And uh, if we do have an emergency, um, BCG Place, which is just on our right here at the front of the BCG building, is our um, place to, um, to, to assemble. This event, as I said, it's been very much um, in the planning for a number of months. It's been made possible um, through the, gov the federal government's Drought Communities Fund, so we're very um, thankful for that. I'm standing here and welcoming you on behalf of not just the Birchip Cropping Group, but also the Bull Oak Shire, the North Central CMA and the Mallee CMA. When uh, we first heard that Bull Oak Shire got the funding for, um, from this community drought fund, we were all able to put up ideas how that funding could be used. And there was a lot of discussion in, in, Birchip, in the Birchip Cropping Group offices about how that money could be best spent. And there's a lot of small projects that, that are being done across the Shire at the moment, and it's been a really terrific injection of funds to our region. But as, um, as the staff and the board at Birchip Cropping Group thought about what, what really could, could make an impact with this, this money, one of the things that came up, someone said, well, we, we have a, a Wimmera advisory group, a group of farmers in the Wimmera. We also have one in the Mallee. But they were saying at a recent meeting, oh, look, you guys ran a climate event about five years ago, and that was really good. You should do something like that again, because we can, we can still remember it. It might have even been longer than five years ago. And we thought, well, obviously climate change is an issue that is... Uh, very much going to be a challenge to our, not just our farmers but our farming communities in the coming years. And for our advisory committee members to rem remember an event that we held quite a while ago and say that they'd like to see something like that happen again, well, we, that's why we decided that this would be our priority for the funding and we're very happy to receive it. Our program today is in the hall and then in the afternoon. But first of all, I'd like to welcome, she's disappeared on me now, uh, our Bullock Shire, Shire Mayor, Councillor Carolyn Stewart, uh, for some opening remarks. Good morning, everyone. It's fantastic to see so many people here, given the time of year that it is. I myself should be um, cooking for sheer as much to my husband's disgust, he has to do it himself. So thank you to everyone for coming. I would like to welcome and thank our special guests, Dr. Anne Webster, MP, and also Gabrielle Chan, who you heard from earlier. I'd also like to acknowledge and thank John Ferrier and Caroline Welsh from BCG, um, my fellow councillors, Councillor Graham Milne, Councillor Bronwyn Simpson, and our council staff that are here as well, and I have apologies from Councillor Pollard, Councillor Warren, Councillor White and Councillor Viz. As Caroline said, this event has been made possible as a result of funding from the Drought Communities Program, funded by the federal government, which aimed to assist drought-affected communities to withstand and, res and respond to long dry spells. Given the changes to seasonal conditions and the effect that more frequent droughts are having on our local community, Apart from projects that would provide much needed infrastructure and investment in local jobs, we were keen to involve the community and farmers in an event that would communicate and help to understand approaches to mitigate and adapt to climate change, to hopefully sustain not only the economic prosperity, but the health and well-being of our local people into the future. 
It's fantastic to be partnering with the BCG, who have been leading these discussions locally for some time, as well as with the North Central and Mallee CMAs. We have some fantastic speakers lined up, and there is a lot of wisdom and energy in the room, and we really hope you get a lot out of today. This day wouldn't be possible without funding from the federal government, so I would like to welcome Dr Anne Webster, federal member for Mallee, to the stage to officially open today's proceedings. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's absolutely wonderful to be here. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the partners who have put together the program for today. And I believe you've had a fantastic start with um, Gabrielle Chan. I missed her talk. I'm disappointed about that. I'll just have to buy her book instead. Thank you to uh, Carolyn Welsh for the warm welcome and Carolyn Stewart today, Mayor of Bull Oak. And uh, hello to John Ferrier, Chair of uh, BCG. I've had the privilege of looking through BCG a couple of times now and seeing the young scientists all at work. It's a very exciting uh, organisation to see research and development at the forefront of farming into the future, which of course is critical as we address climate change, as we address what needs to be addressed so that we can um, do the best for our future. Thank you so much for inviting me to take part in this great local event, and thanks to Birchip Cropping Group, Bull Oak Shire Council, North Central and Mallee Catchment Management Authorities for the idea and drive to put this event on. Events like these are vital to inspire, connect and educate across the agricultural sector and our communities as we strategically plan the future of agriculture and our communities. Agriculture is the backbone of our regional and rural communities. It not only provides local jobs on farm, but is fundamental to supply chains at packing companies, transport businesses, manufacturing, retail and service industries in our town. If there was no agriculture or horticulture, towns like Mildura, Oyen, Swan Hill and Birchip would simply not exist. Agriculture in Mali contributes significantly to our economy. The agricultural sector is valued at approximately $4.2 billion and is predominantly made up of horticulture, broadacre cropping and livestock. The Australian government supports the agriculture industry's ambition to become a $100 billion industry by 2030. Achieving this goal requires the focus and drive of the entire agricultural supply chain. There are a range of issues. Minister McKenzie, Minister for Agriculture, is keen to progress jointly with the states to support the 2030 goal, and climate change adaptation is one of them. The minister and her state counterparts have come to an agreement to progress this work. The four priorities identified in order to deliver a coordinated national approach to agriculture and climate change will contribute to the growth agenda. The four priorities are delivering information and tools for better decisions and risk management, driving research and innovation to support adaptation and mitigation of negative impacts, strengthening market opportunities and business models to build resilience, and finally, preparing for increasing biosecurity risks as the risk of pest, disease and weed incursions change. I had the pleasure yesterday of opening the upgraded Swan Hill Regional Livestock Exchange, a completely upgraded system that will improve the environment for those working there and lead to improved animal welfare. The ag industry is impressive for its resilience and innovation, highlighted by ability to overcome challenges and to flexibly become more competitive, productive and profitable. Thanks to Dorothea McKellar, Australia is known as a continent of droughts and flooding rains. You only have to go back through data supplied by the Bureau of Meteorology to see that throughout our history, there have been times of extreme variability of weather. For example, comparing the rainfall data for Eastern Australia between 1956, when we saw the biggest floods since settlement in the Murray Basin, and 1957, where those same areas experienced floods, just a year later experienced some of the lowest rainfall on record. The current drought conditions that farmers and communities in much of Eastern Australia are experiencing is another in the long-term significant cycle of droughts that have gripped Australia throughout history including the Millennium Drought, the World War II Drought and the Federation Drought. 
The agricultural industry has adapted and improved practices through these events, and I believe that even though many are going through hardship now, the lessons we learn in this drought will prepare us for the next. I think of no-till cropping and some of the work that you're doing here at BCG that have just made farming today possible, even in our drier conditions, that in the past would have seen no crops at all. It is in this space of learning, development and innovation that Rural Research Development Corporations, RDCs, play such a vital role. RDCs have been given a priority to drive research and innovation to support adaptation and mitigation of the impacts of climate change in agriculture, to improve linkages across climate research and innovation and to enhance adoption of new activities and technologies. Mallee organisations such as the Birchip Cropping Group and Mallee Sustainable Farming contribute to research, development and implementation of new technologies that sets the Australian industry apart. BCG are, not, are a not-for-profit organisation who, through the support of their members, are actively working, researching and developing tools and methods to improve resilience. The members of BCG should be proud that the organisation is recognised both nationally and internationally by the industry as a credible, independent and innovative organisation. Sometimes RDCs can get caught looking at data sets on computer screens in offices far removed from the paddock. In contrast, BCG's research and communication activities provide evidence, support and practical tools for improving farm management practices and profitability. The work of BCG has been integral in the adoption of new agronomic technologies and farming practices and continues to help farmers make decisions, develop risk management strategies, increase profits and operate sustainable farming operations, which is why I'm very happy to see the appointment of Caroline Welsh to the government's Future Drought Fund panel. The Morrison-McCormack government is committed to doing all it can to future-ready farmers so they can cope with the changing climate and the impacts that, will have, that will have on their businesses and the communities that support them. The government acknowledges that climate change is an important factor to consider when supporting long-term preparedness, sustainability, resilience and risk management for farming businesses and farming communities in Australia. We know that drought is a constant threat in Australia and there is plenty of research available to show that as the climate continues to change, there is the risk of increase in occurrence and duration of droughts. For example, the drought that we are currently experiencing is considered by many to be the worst on record and modelling available now shows that it will continue with forecasts pointing to a dry summer and spring, sorry, spring and summer. The federal government is listening and responding to the acute situation farmers are experiencing. We have put in place a series of drought responses from helping out farmers on the ground through farm household allowance and concessional loans through the Rural Investment uh, Corporation, as well as cash payments to help with groceries and school fees. We know that when our farmers are doing it tough, the community is as well, which is why we've put in place programs to help the community more broadly, such as the Drought Communities Program. This program is to generate activity in the community and was directly supported this conference, has supported this conference today, as Carolyn pointed out earlier. But we know that droughts will continue into the future, and that is why we have made an initial investment of $3.9 billion in the Future Drought Fund. This investment will grow to $5 billion and will deliver $100 million every year. This permanent revenue stream will be used by the federal government to help build resilience for farmers and communities to prepare for inevitable future droughts. Work has commenced on developing the fund's drought resilience funding plan, a high-level framework to guide the approach for supporting future projects and activities. This process includes a six-week period of public consultation through the Department of Agriculture Have Your Say website, which is expected to commence shortly. In fact, it is now uh, up and running, I believe. I want to encourage you all to get online and have your say. The fund will support initiatives that enhance the drought resilience of Australian farms and communities by becoming more prepared to respond to the impacts of drought. As we prepare to be future ready, the challenges are undeniably great and the risk that climate change and global conditions play are significant. However, we have an industry and communities that have proven resilient, innovative and connected and a government that is committed to supporting it as it grows into the $100 billion industry we know it can be. As a Nationals member, it's in our DNA to represent rural and regional communities and be their loud voice in Canberra. 
As you attend the conference today, I hope you will keep your minds open and be bold to share your ideas openly. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anne. Uh, and actually, I wouldn't mind your notes because I think some of the words you spoke, particularly about um, the, the challenges that we will face with climate change, but very much the, uh, the state we are in, the very good state we are in to respond to them because of the resilient farming practices and changes that we've made and the, the very strong communities we have in rural areas, I think, um, a words that I would, uh, would, would very much applaud and share. So thank you very much for that address. We'll now move on to um, setting the scene for um, the, the conference today. And I think BCG is very much a science-based organisation. We've always prided ourselves and worked very hard to ensure that the, the research that we conduct on farmers properties is the very best that we can do. So an important part of understanding the challenges and opportunities ahead of us is about understanding the science. And so our first um, speaker in this setting the scene session is Dr. Peter Heyman. I'm very pleased to see, um, some, see Peter back in Birchip again. It's a few years since we've had him um, speak in Birchip. I actually think that the, I was saying to him the last time I saw him was at a climate change event we ran um, for some of our partners, which would be at least six years ago in Melbourne. So um, I'd like to welcome Peter to speak to you. He's the principal scientist for climate applications at SARDI in South Australia. He's got over 25 years experience in the climate science relating to farming systems and being from South Australia has um, a very good understanding of the type of Mallee and Wimmera farming systems that we, that we work in in the Mallee. So welcome Peter. Um, thanks very much and it's, re it's really great to be here. I, I've titled this Beyond the Damage Report. I think one of the problems of um, people like me coming to these things is we tend to just talk about how everything is going to go to custard um, and, uh, and, and, and there'll be a lot of, lot of um, tears and bad language as climate change continues to happen and so on. I think we need to go beyond that. I think it's, it's a recognising people's sense of place and people's sense of purpose in what, what they're doing and I think that's, that's, that's important. It's also the case that, um, I mean, Al, Al Gore made the point that denial and despair have this in common, you don't do anything. So if you just end up in denial or despair, and, I, and it always worries me a little bit about days like this is that you might come with denial and leave in despair. Um, so I think it's really, uh, really encouraging with BCG and with the activities here is that it's about what do we do? And I think the, the, um, the talk, some of the talks this afternoon and so on, on, on people doing things, on renewable energy and all these things and so on, is really, really an important part of that. So the comedian David Mitchell has this great soapbox where he just rants about different things. One of the things he rants about is, that the, is about climate change and, and people talking about climate change. And he goes on to make the point that um, a lot of discussion on climate change fits into these two sort of adult tropes. One is, um, uh, one is, I warned you this would happen, and the other is, um, cleaning up your room will be such fun. And, and I think that there's an element there where, um, especially the latter, we've got to say that this is a really serious problem and we do need to take some serious steps and not all of them will necessarily be fun. I had this slide, I was going through my talk briefly 
and Haram was behind me and he tapped me on the shoulder when I had this slide there. Um, I've used this slide many times and the reason why is because for people who've, um, who haven't heard this talk or some of the aspects of this talk before, this is something that Stephen Schneider, who's an eminent climate scientist, um, had this simple analogy or this simple metaphor of you can have this argument with a kid at the beach as to what destroyed the sandcastle. Was it the wave or the tide? And you can go backwards and forwards, was it the wave or the tide? Obviously, it's the wave that destroys the sandcastle. But on a rising tide, there's more waves. If you like. The, 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 the two work together. We have this false discussion as if it's all tide or all wave. We have this discussion, every time there's a wave, like a drought or a heat wave or everybody else, we have this discussion, is this climate change or isn't it? What's variability, what's not? In the farming community, I'll often have people come up to me after and say, um, I'm a bit of a wave man myself, because basically rural communities are really deeply, deeply aware of the wave in the way that urban communities aren't. Urban communities are much more conscious of the, of the, the tide and suddenly when there's a drought and, or there's water restrictions, it's sort of like what, what's happening here, whereas rural communities have lived through that for, for, for many, many um, years. So this idea of the wave and the tide, the other aspect about this is that sometimes with talks and so on, people will say, look, just talk about variability, because if you talk about climate change, you'll upset people. Um, I think, again, this idea we need to have this adult conversation about this is an, is an important part of that. The, 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 um, the other reason that I will never just talk about variability, well, the two reasons is one is that clearly, and I hope to show you a little bit, the evidence just isn't, isn't there at all. But the other one is that there have been rural communities and people like BCG but people like John, like Ian, like Carol, like others who have stood up and said, this isn't just variability, this is climate change. And how dare um, we ever back away from that. We need to support people who have made that courageous statement in rural communities that this is something more than just year-to-year -year variability. We need to acknowledge that. So really quickly here, this is a, um, a, a graph. And, and, I, and I really, um, really like Gabby's point about having to listen to individual cultures, individual experiences, and so on. It's also, I'll also put in a word for we need to combine that with data which is aggregated. We, because the problem with the individual story is that someone will then have a story, yeah, 1922 or something was pretty dry or something, and, and we, we, we end up in that sort of sterile debate. We're really grateful that we have the Bureau of Meteorology with really good data showing that something's happening here. So here we have, this is for Australian temperature, going up and down, there are waves and tides, but basically and simply to explain that grey going up, you need to run the models with greenhouse gases. If you don't, so, the, so up to about 1960, it didn't really matter if you used greenhouse gases or not to run the model. That would explain what was happening. But you have to bring in the tide to explain what's happening with, with Australia's temperature there. The other aspect about this is that it's, not, it's 2019 today. It, we're almost into 2020. This was, goes back to the CSIRO 92 projections about what was happening. And clearly, something was happening, something was suggesting what was happening there, and the weather and the climate has done a very good job of fitting in with, with, with what was discussed back then. So this is Thomas Stocker, who's the um, head of the, uh, um, of the climate science part of the IPCC discussion. And he's saying this is a, he came to Adelaide to the Greenhouse Conference and said this is a mature science. What he's saying is that we won't get new headlines out of climate change every day. We're understanding what's going on. There's simple explanations ab about, about where we're going. What we're saying is that the world's warming and it could warm very, very worryingly. There's less confidence about what's happening with drying, 
but a worry about drying in the mid-latitudes. So what I say to farmers in South Australia is that a warmer world would be a wetter world, except where you chose to buy or inherit a farm. Okay, so in the mid-latitudes tend to be places which tend to show drying, and you can see that around the world. You can see that, just listen to the radio this morning about the um, fires in California and so on. It's these mid-latitudes which seem to be showing this, this drying. So this is just really quickly. In 2013, the Climate Council put out this wonderful graphic about the angry summer. It was incredibly hot in 2013. Then 2016, 2017, it was hot again, so they talked about another angry summer in 2016, 2017. Last year was the angriest summer. So what we're saying is just running out of polite words to discuss what's going on um, and, 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 and superlatives and so on. Clearly things are happening here. And, and last summer was extraordinarily hot, and just the, the amount of um, records that were broken by extraordinary amounts and so on, especially through that northern New South Wales, southern Queensland area and so on. But this is not just um, this is recent information, not just the last summer, but the Northern Hemisphere summer had these non, had these extreme heat conditions. And there's India with 51.8. Um, uh, so these these extraordinarily um, um, hot conditions, and enormous death and so on through those those, experience, those areas. Clear evidence on rainfall, on temperature. Rainfall is less clear, but a really worrying aspect about a drying in the southern part of Australia. This is less. This is this is this is just records of what's happening. It's worrying, but less certain. One of the really important points is that we went through the Millennium Drought, but since the Millennium Drought, the La Nina of 2010 and the Indian Ocean Dipole of 2016 have been the two wet years. So you see this, the, the, where we've, we've gone through there. So here's my quick, uh, uh, with a colleague, a quick thing of birdship rainfall. Um, as we, we, this, is, this is the from 2000 to 2019. Um, so the growing season, I'm, we're saying, is, is we, we're sort of working out what will happen at the end of October. But the growing season is, is Decile three, but the really interesting aspect is that the you had an incredibly wet summer, and a decile ten summer and a decile one spring. What I think is a real credit to the farming system here is you were able to take a decile. Look, just driving and seeing the crops, you have taken a decile ten summer and solved a decile one spring, and that's 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 a real credit to what's what's gone on. When you go to the South Australian Mallee, you see what a decile one summer and a decile one spring looks like. Okay, and, and it's not pretty. So with temperature, we're seeing that, but just the other interesting point with temperature is you've had an extraordinarily cool spring. So this spring has been, has been very, very cool, um, which, is, which has been a... Uh, um, but basically what we're seeing is just a lot of red in there, a lot of decile tens in, 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 in there, and we go, this can go back a, a long way. There's just the, the September period. I just want to briefly finish with a quick sort of um, uh, uh, um, a quick advertisement to this forecast for profits tool with Graham Anderson that we've, that this is about the waves. This is about, there is information on waves and better and better information on waves. So this is a tool that you can look up um, for climate tool forecast for profit and you can basically see where what the pie charts look like for an El Nino for a La Nina in locations. You can click on that, that map and actually look at where birdship is and, and what's happening with birdship, but you can see the really spatial coherent aspects of that. And, and, it's, and I just, um, when I was talking in, the, in Loxton, a very dry part of South Australia, a farmer came up to me afterwards and showed his mobile phone and showed just this idea of where, where, where his farm was there. This is, this is, if you like, the square cloud theory, that some, some paddocks are much better off than others. And that's clearly to do with management, to do with early sowing, to do with summer weed control and these sort of things and so on. 
I think, I think that, that, that what this points to is the enormous adaptive capacity that people, that people have. So, so the fact that there's difference there speaks to the adaptive capacity, which is part of, the, part of that resilience. Somebody else in the Mallee um, was, was writing about, was supporting um, glyphosate, was, was because obviously the reason for that success has got a lot to do with low-cost glyphosate. And they were supporting that. And, and, they, and somebody from South Africa was saying, you're just a stooge for, um, for uh, um, one of the, the, the companies. And this guy went backwards and forwards. What, what turned out is that the guy said, I know you're a stooge for one of these companies because you, I've gone through your records and, and your past Facebook tweets and so on, and you're saying that you can grow a crop on less than 100 millimetres growing season rainfall, and I know that that's impossible. The story is that people are doing that with some of weed control and so on, and, and doing what someone from South Africa, an agricultural scientist in Africa, is saying is impossible. So that, that's, that speaks to the resilience and the ability to manage some of these things. Um, at this meeting at Loxton, though, other people are also pointing out that when you get these really tough years, no matter what you do, there's some times where it's, we do need water to grow crops. So I, I'm, I am saying that there's this huge adaptive capacity. We can go well beyond the damage report, but the problem is that as we start moving to these drier events, we get awfully choosy about the rain, where the rain falls and, 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 and some, of, some of the challenges there. So that the, what's happening with the rainfall aspect is something that we really, really have to keep an eye for because these crops in Loxton are, are ruined at this stage. So that they look, look different then at that time of year, but then, then through this time it's, it's, it's been lost through there. So I just, um, it was a really, really quick run through setting the scene. I think that waves and tide we know that there's year-to-year -year variability. We learn from that. We learn from the resilience through that and so on. We've got to keep an eye on this tide and workshops like this, discussions like this, which acknowledge both the waves and the tide are just incredibly valuable in, 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 in um, building that resilience. Thanks. Thanks very much, Peter, and I think that was an excellent um, way of setting the scene. Um, for those of you who don't mind a little bit of swearing, David Mitchell also does a really good, funny um, few videos on farming. Um, if any of you want to have a look at that, it's, it's very amusing. Um, so we're going to have questions for speakers at the end of the session, if that's okay. So our next speaker is Graham Anderson um, from Agriculture Victoria. Um, you may have seen him present before because he, uh, that is basically what he does. Uh, he's a, um, an extension and science, science communicator, very much in the climate space. There are many farmers in the room who would, um, would regularly receive emails from AgVic around the break, and Graham was instrumental in, in, in setting up, that up and developing it. He's also involved in the soil moisture monitor updates and the, the famous climate dogs that chase their way around um, our state causing different weather. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I'll just welcome um, Graeme Anderson to the stage. Thanks, Graeme. So thank you, uh, and thanks to the organisers today, and um, courage and leadership for running a climate change event. And we know you can't fix things that you actually uh, not able to talk about. So it's really important that these events are, are on. Um, so uh, yes, Ag Victoria, I know people uh, familiar with the break and Dale Gray um, often playing his ukulele up here and BCG has been a great supporter of that. And it was terrific on Friday night, I was at Yay and a farmer pulled out his iPhone, had a picture of a sea surface temperature anomaly map and could explain why the, the current positive phase of the Indian Ocean Dipole was happening and the cloud had disappeared from up there and why they were expecting a bobtail spring. And that says a lot to climate literacy, which is about understanding what's been happening there. We know um, there's uh, Dale Boyd as well with the soil moisture probes, and you didn't need a soil moisture probe here last December to know that it was wet um, when you received a growing season's worth of rainfall in two days. So, but that is really important stuff, and it's been terrific. I think the soil probe at Birchip 
um, which measured moisture down to a metre. It was in for four years before it registered. We were wondering if it was hooked up properly, but it was terrific to see this year starting uh, with a, a profile, which is really important. That's part of you know, all of the great stuff that's been happening. Um, climate webinars, climate dogs, lots of stuff there. Um, I'm giving a bit of a plug here because these are just new. The Bureau of Meteorology have, um, have just done these for each region. They're little four-page fact sheets. They basically talk about the last 100 years of um, local temperature um, and rainfall, and then they also look into what are some of those trends recently. So it's a really valuable little four-pager. Grab it, um, pin it up around the place, have a look, because it's sort of one of the key things before you even start talking about projections of the future, understanding what's been happening longer term and where are we recently, that's a good place to start. So for the Mallee, um, you know, rainfall decreasing of recent. Most of the decrease recently has been in autumn and spring months. Um, and uh, um, what else have we got there? So spring frosts have been more common, um, occurring later. There's been more warm days. So a bit of a combination there, and none of this is news to farmers who have been dealing with that. And like we said, some fantastic practices to, to adapt to that. Because really with winter cropping, um, one of the challenges is, you know, autumns are really important, and that's the takeoff. And then spring's important, that's the landing. So you've been dealing with you know, someone tampering with the run edges of the runway with some bumpy uh, takeoffs and bumpy landings and doing a great job. And thanks to the work of the group here, which is really improving everyone's piloting skills to, uh, to get through this. But as, um, you know, if you head up to the northwest of the Mallee, some people didn't even get a, enough for a takeoff this year. And that's that sort of difference between, you know, variability and saying, well, you know, we do it need this summer rain. Um, so here's just a, a bit more from that little um, brochure. Uh, this is um, the, the red is, this is uh, monthly rainfall. Um, the last 30 years is, is in red and the previous 30 years is in blue. So there's two sort of different lived experiences there, um, depending on what area you're farming in. And one of those things is too, is that we, um, we're very much, what we've experienced is what gives us that resilience and some, uh, a drought that someone might have experienced in 1914, um, you know, that's just sort of history. When it happens to you, it's fair dinkum real. So part of it is we experience this as we go. Uh, and yes, the frost risk, you know, this is a bit of a surprise. A lot of the climate change modelling earlier was talking about warmer days and there'll be less frosts, but really um, we've been ending up with um, more frosts and it's to do with you know, the, the subtropical ridge and the pressure pattern being a bit stronger. And it's part of the, the discussions around, well, what can models tell us about the future, but what, where there might be a few surprises thrown in amongst it. Which is why I'll talk about modelling, because there's a lot of discussions around modelling that's misunderstood, and I'm fairly sceptical of models at the best of time, but I've been looking at them for a fair while. And it's interesting, farmers have models in their heads. So if you ask a farmer about a paddock, and say, so what sort of yield might you get in this? And so, oh, you know, this paddock will yield three tonne. It's yielded up to six, and I know some years it's been, you know, less than one, but, you know, I, I know that's what it'll probably yield because, you know, um, I know what's grown there in the past, I know the history, I know the range of rainfall we get, the drainage, how it's better in one end and a, and a bit, bit crook at the other. I know what fertility happens, and I know because of previous seasons, that history of what that can do. So it's not a surprise. So as a starting point for the model is, I know I can grow three tonnes there because I've done it before. So, you know, proof. But I also know that stuff can go wrong. And there's things like, you know, curve bull sowing issues and the issue of getting, the risk of getting a blocked, a blockage when you're sowing is directly proportional to whether it's a roadside paddock or not. Um, <laughs> Uh, disease, pests, weeds, um, you know, all of those sort of things, frost, heat, drought, herbicide issues, and of course, any form of grazing, they're curveballs in there. So you start off knowing that, yeah, I know that paddock can grow three tonne, um, but, and we know that if there's more rain, you know, we'll get more, and if we add more nitrogen, we'll get more, but also there's some things can take that off. So that's all part, that's in the model. Um, so one of the things is that farmers know these are facts, but these things, are they in the model or not? And whenever we look at models, and whether they're weather models, seasonal forecast models, or climate change models, that's part of what um, we all need to look at is, well, which ones are the known things, and then which are the ones where there's a bit more room to move or a bit of debate about? 
So um, I was thinking about climate projections the other day and, and saying that sometimes we don't do a good job of explaining some of this. And I'm look, talking about weather forecasts, seasonal forecasts, which is say the next three months, and I'll talk about climate change projections. But weather forecasts, we're talking about you know, the next eight days, and weather forecast is about you know, how much rain you're going to get, what time it will get to, what's maximum temperatures and minimums. And you know, the highest confidence in our forecasting, they're called deterministic forecasts. Day one is obviously a lot more accurate than day eight. And anyone that tells you they know exactly what's going to happen on the weather on day 18 is pulling your leg. It can't be done. No one in the world can do it. Um, websites offer it because it's great clickbait. But no one can actually give you an accurate daily forecast beyond you know, 18 days. Um, there's also beware curveballs such as thunderstorms. They might predict that you know, tomorrow it might be thunderstorm in the afternoon, but no one actually knows where that thunderstorm is going to start and track until it's actually there. And that can give you 80 mils out of nowhere and people say, oh, they're hopeless, they can't predict that. They say, well, uh, you're looking in the wrong places because that's, that's not something that you can predict ahead of time. Um, seasonal forecast, so the next three months. So you're saying, well, if you can't predict weather beyond sort of eight, 10 days, then how can you predict the next three months? Well, we're not flying blind there. Um, there's less confidence, but we're not flying blind. And they talk about these are probabilistic forecasts. There's lots of model runs. The probabilities change or skew depending on factors like what's happening with the significant oceans um, around Australia and especially to our north and the Indian Ocean and our El Nino, Pacific Ocean, they're really important. And when you've got a current sea surf and temperature phase like off northwest of Australia, cooler water, there's a positive Indian Ocean dipole at the minute. If you run weather models over that, you know, and you run them 100 times and keep them running for three months, you know, um, two thirds of them will be drier than average just because most of those rain events that they simulate can't find a good signal for moisture to plug into. So, so in, especially in those years when there's a major climate driver underway, those seasonal forecasts actually do provide a bit more value. Some other years they don't offer much value more than to tossing a coin. Um, but climate change projections, so where do they fit in? So, so there's high confidence in some elements. The actual increased heat, um, uh, that's really a, a known thing and a fact that's been known for a long while. In fact, we're more confident about the coming decades being warmer than we are about the weather on day 10. And we probably don't say that a lot. Um, the projections and models and models runs differ. Some match recent trends better than others. Um, and there's sort of curveballs in there in that there's a lot that they don't know. And the frost one is a good example, you know, where, where farmers have farmed through 25 years of a few more frosts popping up in spring and the science is sort of catching up to say, yeah, we think we know why. Um, there's a lot of lessons in that because agriculture will have quite a few of those little surprises along the way that weren't well predicted. Agriculture's got to be dealing with this stuff as it happens. And I think the grains industry does a brilliant job of doing that. We get regular feedback each year, I guess. Um, so plenty of curveballs there. And if I was giving gold logies, they sort of look like logies or stars, um, you know, I'd say most confident about, you know, these, the, the um, weather forecasts, especially um, the next few days. We're confident with seasonal forecasts, especially when there's um, a major climate phase. And we're really confident in this sort of heat. And when the world gets um, warmer, the tropics expands from the equator and it nudges everything towards the poles. It's just simple physics for how the planet works. And I was really surprised when the UK chief scientist um, talked about this, um, the, ex the experiments back from John Tyndall in the 1850s. So when the gold rush was on in Victoria, this is how old this science is. And talking about, um, you know, we get energy from the sun during the day and it warms up the land surface. And, and our cars out there, the dashboards will be warming up as we speak. Um, but at night when the sun sets, that heat from the Earth's surface radiates back out to space. And so back, back in the 1800s, they were saying, you know what, all that heat we know how much heat we get. That heat should all radiate back out to space at night. And if it did, it would be about 30 degrees cooler every morning. And as a kid growing up, waiting for the bus um, at a farm north of Ballarat, some mornings I thought all of the heat had escaped uh, from the Earth's surface. So they went to experiment to say, well, what's, what's trapping that heat at night, stopping it all from escaping? So grab the, grab the atmosphere, the gases, took out the impurities and started with, with what 98% of the atmosphere was, it's just nitrogen and oxygen, passed the heat radiation through them and it slipped straight through. So he said if our atmosphere was just nitrogen, gas and oxygen, then we would freeze every night. 
got the impurities, which was the, the other gases, put, put them in past the heat radiation and it, and it absorbed them. The heat didn't, didn't get through. So it said, these are the greenhouse gases. They trap that heat. And um, it's interesting at a structural level, like oxygen, which doesn't trap heat, is just O2, two atoms stuck together. Nitrogen gas is just N2, two nitrogen atoms stuck together. And all the greenhouse gases, CO2, CH4, H2O, like they've all more complex molecules and they trap heat. So that's been known since the gold rush. Um, it's unpopular, but it's just facts. And the outer stratosphere is cooling, inner atmosphere is warming. So that car analogy, if you've got two cars parked out there today, they're both getting the same energy from the sun, both dashboards getting the same heat generating off them. If one of those cars has got the windows down and one's got the windows up, what do you think you'll find if you go out and check it at lunchtime? You'll find a difference. They're both getting the same energy, but they've got a different energy in, energy out ratio. The one with the windows up, it's going to be a lot warmer. So the emission story is about humans winding up the windows. And we've just started that journey. And there's being asked, I guess, are we smart enough to stop winding up? This is our maximum temperature deciles since 1910 for Australia, with blue being cooler than average years and orange being warmer than average. So a lot of variability in that pattern. But you can start to see now the windows are starting to be wind up. What was projected with those warming trends has just started. So it's just started. Those gases will keep um, doing that warming for a while. So, so, we're, um, so this is a key challenge for us, so the difference between variability, and we've all seen these maps of climate change um, and variability, the temperature story is different. So we've seen these trends. Um, and you know, this is just seasonal trends. Spring is, is particularly warming with one to three degrees warmer. That's sort of a month out of whack. So the Bureau just described it, we're squeezing in an extra month of summer. Um, now, the, where does it go from here? There's brand new climate projections for Victoria. So these were just put out in the last couple of weeks. So there's brochures for, um, for each region of the state and they're really looking at what are the sort of futures from here. Um, basically, as Pete showed, the difference is all of the models show warming up. The difference is how much depends on how much we wind the windows up. It's about the, the emissions. And it also doesn't stop at magically at the year 2100. So what, we're at a point in history, the next 20 years, about whether we can, we can actually slow, slow that down. There are real choices now. In the last 20 years, we could have done more. So this next 20 years, though, has implications for a lot longer. So it's a here and now issue for us. Um, I was even surprised with this. It was in the modelling. This is a, um, for, for Victoria. Figure 27. Daily maximum temperatures for an example, extreme heat day under a very high scenario of high emissions in the 2050s, where Melbourne reaches 50 degrees and even higher temperatures inland. There's a warm bias in this Gippsland area. But note, this is not the hottest day in simulations. It's just in indicative of a very hot day in the future climate without a historical precedent. Now, that's if we basically make excuses like, oh, the emissions is hard or whatever. This is a, a risk that I think we all want to avoid. And the good news is we can. Like, we've got all of the technologies available to do this. It's really interesting that if you look at, say, the economy of California, which in itself is in sort of the top six sort of economies of the world, if it was a country. Um, their journey of, you know, increasing GDP, a heap of policies put in place um, about reducing emissions. So it's not about going backwards. This is about going forwards. We're trying to divert the risks of, uh, you know, runaway climate change and actually make our societies better and do the things that reduce emissions along the way. And there's lots of stuff we can do. Great stuff for agriculture. There's great speakers here today talking about energy. We know with land care, we know there's improved technologies for livestock um, coming on stream, um, you know, improved fertility of soils. Um, lots of great stuff that's coming. And, um, and I thought I'd throw in this one just as an example of positive carbon. Like, since the 1954, I think, there's a, there's a um, uh, Ortec manufacture straw panel in Bendigo. You know, so employ about 30 people. Um, that straw is taken carbon out of the atmosphere. When it's put into a building product and then put into a, a building, that carbon has been taken out and put in that building for the life of that building for 80 years. And the next year, 
that straw can be, you can do that again. It's actually a, an example of a carbon flow of carbon out of the atmosphere and into buildings. Um, from a farm point of view, we'd take about five to eight tonnes of CO2 per hectare per year out of the atmosphere and into buildings, creating a lot of jobs, uh, a lot of activity here, you know, another backup income for farming. And that's an example of what carbon positive um, farming is. This stuff's all quite doable. Um, it's just about work out how do we get there. So have a look if you build your next house, give them a hand. There should be about 50 of these things around the place. So, um, so I think you know, when we're, humans are at our best when we're having a go, there's a, there's a lot at stake, but we've got all of the things we need to actually get onto this. So, so and I look forward to hearing about more of these discussions um, later today. So thank you, all of the solutions we've got at hand. So thanks BCG for all of the work that's been done on getting them applied here in real life. So thanks. Thanks very much, Graham. I think you could probably say that our first two speakers were probably the usual suspects that you might expect in a, uh, certainly in a farming sort of conference related to climate change. Uh, our next speaker, Charlotte Turner, um, is, a, is, a, is someone we haven't had speak for us before and probably uh, has a slightly different background. She's actually a, a lawyer and associate in Minter Ellison's climate risk governance team focusing on climate risks and how they relate to, to business and community groups. Uh, she, she's very much a... Um, I suppose one of the things that uh, when we were organising this uh, event, we were very clear that it was um, not just about, like I said, our usual suspects, our farming farmers and the, the sort of science that we've had presented this morning. It's actually about community groups. It's about um, local farm business, uh, local businesses. And so the idea about inviting Charlotte Turner to talk to us was because um, obviously there are risks associated with climate that aren't just directly related to farming, but also related to everyone's everyday lives, um, the livabilities of our cities, and also um, potentially our um, for directors and people on community groups. Um, Minto Ellison um, worked quite a bit with um, companies. As you know, as you probably have heard, some of the really bigger companies have actually got climate change policies. Their boards have actually considered um, the risks associated with, with climate. And they've also, um, uh, insurance companies are also considering their, their risks associated with, with climate change. So Minta and Allison do quite a lot of work working with private companies and um, the, the, the boards at that level trying to consider what risks are associated with climate change for their business. And it's going to become a growing part of um, businesses into the future. And for those of us who are on local committees and on local community groups, those issues are just as real as well. I'm sure that I know there's many people in this, um, in this room who would be involved in a local football club, involved in a, a, a CMA committee or a board, and a lot of the responsibilities and legal requirements for company boards flow through to community groups and community committees. So that's why we, we thought it would be interesting to have Charlotte speak with us today. So without further ado, I'd like to hopefully welcome Charlotte Turner. The other thing is that one of the things we've tried to do with our um, this climate event is actually encourage some of our speakers from far away to come in via video conferencing. Oh, I'm very big. <laughs> Hello, Charlotte. Good morning, everybody. So I've just um, I've just introduced you, Charlotte. Um, I've been a bit long-winded because we ha we're having trouble with the video conferencing. You could probably tell that. Um, I'm not <laughs> no very worries. good at the padding. Um, but anyway, so so welcome, um, Charlotte. I hope you can see um, everyone in the room. I can. Yes. And we look forward to your presentation. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, so as hopefully you can all see on the screen today, I am here to not talk about the environment or climate change. I am a corporate lawyer. So I'm here to talk to you about money and the risk of climate change through um, a legal and financial lens. Um, 
so the key messages that I'm going to be sort of delivering from my presentation today are that climate change has really evolved from a ethical, greeny, hippie, environmental issue to one that now presents material risks and opportunities um, from a financial and legal um, lens. And as I'll sort of briefly go through my presentation, we'll see that, you know, the capital markets, regulators are all on board in taking this as a very serious material issue that it doesn't really now matter what people's beliefs are in relation to climate change, political beliefs, any of those sorts of things. When the people who are controlling the money and the regulators believe it, it's something that we all need to start taking um, and paying attention to. So briefly, today I will talk about the three categories of um, what are described as financial and legal risks in relation to climate change, and then also touch on the opportunities that um, these present. So um, on our next slide, there we go. Um, the Bank of England have captured what they consider and now what are widely considered as the three um, subheadings of what legal and financial climate change risk are. They are the physical, risks of climate change, the economic um, transition risks of moving towards a net zero carbon economy and the liability consequences of failing to mitigate, adapt or disclose um, any of those financial or legal risks. So I will really briefly touch on the physical exposures um, because I know that they'll be discussed a lot today. Um, so I think the main risk of the physical exposures are the increased ferocity and frequency of extreme weather events. Um, the gradual onset of continual sea level rises, the ice melting, regional temperatures, rainfall variations, um, and the ecological impacts, including the mass extinction of flora and fauna and biodiversity loss. If we keep emitting as a global economy in the way that we are doing, business as usual, no adaptation or mitigation, we are heading towards an increase in temperature of around four degrees. Um, coming from the north of England and currently living in Melbourne, that doesn't actually sound that bad. Um, and however, what we do know about this increase in temperature is that the last ice age we were in was four degrees lower than the pre-industrial temperature rises. Um, and although there's absolutely no certainty about what that means, what we do know is that it represents a fundamental shift in the Earth's surface. Um, so things like expecting the dry to be drier, the wet to be wetter, and increasing in those catastrophic events. So science tells us to stabilise the climate. We need to operate in a way that keeps the temperature well below two degrees pre-industrial times. Um, on the uh, on the, the graph before, we saw that there was um, sort of a blue level, which represents the two degrees, um, and the, the the red trajectory is is what we are heading towards if the global economy doesn't start shifting towards a net zero. Um, uh, emitting and even if you just think about what you have done this morning you woke up turned the light on probably had a cup of coffee brushed your teeth you drove here em emitting and emissions are ubiquitous in absolutely everything we do and um the the seismic shift that it's going to require to to get to that two degrees um is quite a, a daunting thought but definitely something that that is that is achievable so just really briefly looking at um, some um, stats and predictions that um, heat waves, about heat waves in Victoria that the Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning have prepared, that they show the impacts of that $305 million figure could be the potential impacts of one extreme heat wave in Victoria. And as I touched on really briefly then, and as I'm sure you'll hear throughout the course of the day, that the, the the increasing temperature we are heading towards temperatures that will that we may now think as extreme or have been classed as extreme in the past but actually are becoming a lot more 
frequent and those temperatures will become our norm. And if this is the financial impact that we're going to be seeing because of one of those events, uh, this needs to be something we think about really carefully. So I'll now talk about the economic transition impacts. And this, these are the, the impacts on how we move the global economy from emitting is the way that we do to a net zero um, economy. These are the risks of the market responses to that transition and reckon the recognition globally that there does have to be a change. The economic transition risks are broken up into three categories, uh, the physical, um, sorry, the um, sort of driven by technological, social stakeholder responses and policy and regulation. Um, uh, which slide are we on? And um, we can go to the next slide. Uh, so we'll look at um, uh, see the technology shifts um, represent things. You know, we live in a market economy and people innovate to make money. Um, innovation and improvements to technology so that people can become more competitive in a decarbonized economy and how to sort of make the best out of it. And we're seeing that in areas such as battery storage and the electrification of vehicles. Um, that's a classic example of a market at work um, and big competition in the renewable energy market. Um, it's a big area of innovation. The, there are policies and regulations being made all over the world about the phasing out of internal combustion engine cars and the sort of market and technical technological responses to that are um, the mass increase in research and innovation and of the electrification of vehicles. You know, for example, in the United Kingdom now, there are more electric charging vehicle stations than um, petrol bases. Um, and you know, the greeny hippies at places like Bloomberg and McKinsey are, are putting out data that says, you know, 75% of developed countries, um, you know, when looking at setting up new coal fire plants or continuing running coal mines, it's actually cheaper to buy a whole new solar plant and run it on battery, on battery and that the provision of that electricity and provision of that will be cheaper and when those sorts of tipping points are reached it doesn't really matter because consumers generally don't care if something's cheaper and better quality that's what they're going to go for um and when looking at the stakeholder shifts as i'm sure lots of you have been aware of there has been a huge push by the younger generation and millennials and the massive movement of school children sort of requiring governments to take action onto climate change. Millennials don't really know a world without resource scarcity. And it's an issue that's taken very seriously and not just their own personal views, but where they want to work um, the companies that they buy from. We've seen an enormous shift in the last 12 to 18 months on the, on the use of single use plastic. You know, if you use a straw or a single use coffee cup now, you know there's a millennial pointing their finger at you. Um, and looking at the, the regulatory and policy responses to the transition to a low carbon economy in Australia, was, those are things like the carbon tax that we did have and now we don't have. Um, and these policy and regulatory responses are in response to one overarching agreement, the Paris Agreement, in which 160 countries agreed on the science and agreed to limit global warming, global warming and to maintain a healthy global economy um, by the middle of this century. And the countries all agreed that they would go off and implement their own policies and regulations um, to meet those agreements. In Australia, there's currently targets of reducing emissions to around 26% um, below 2005 level, five levels by the middle of the century. Built within the Paris Agreement is a five-year review and ratcheting process in which there will be a sharp focus on the countries that um, within that agreement don't seem to be taking adequate steps to implement those policies to meet those Paris Agreement targets. All over the world, we're seeing countries now legislating um, to do that. A couple of examples that I've got up on my slide. Um, in New Zealand, they've introduced a bill for zero carbon emissions by 2050. 
And what they've actually done is they've split their emission reductions into carbon reductions and biogenic methane reductions. So a reduction of biogenic methane by 10% in 2030 and by 43% by 2050. Um, and we saw a while ago that the UK currently went a significant period of time without using coal fire, coal fire power, which is the first time since 1862. So countries around the world are um, reacting and putting in place its policies and um, regulations to, to meet those Paris Agreement targets. And um, having discussed the, the millennials and their sort of stakeholder shifts, it actually isn't just that end of the spectrum. We are now seeing institutional investors are squarely focusing on climate change as a financial risk issue. In 2016, an eminent QC published an opinion um, and updated that opinion in 2019 that reinforces the view that as a matter of Australian law, directors now must actively engage with the impacts of climate change to satisfy their director's duties. And since 2016, the developments have shifted that the standard of conduct to require, required to discharge the obligations of reasonable director is now, is now higher. Um, and we have seen that this opinion has been endorsed and picked up by our corporate regulators, ASIC, APRA, the Accounting Standards Board. And essentially, they have put directors on notice that they must approach climate change now through a financial risk, but also an opportunity lens. Um, ASIC has recently updated its regulatory um, guide in relation to prospectuses um, to incorporate the types of climate change financial risks and also in another one of their regulatory guides um, setting out that an entity an entity's financial prospects for the future years may now need to start including perceived climate change related risks and how those risks are being mit mitigated and strategies moving forward to deal with them um, so up on this slide here we see a range of the institutional investors that um, have picked up climate change as a material and financial risk. Climate Action 100 is an investor initiative and they, they have sort of come together to ensure that the world's largest corporate greenhouse emitters are taking the necessary actions on climate change. Following the, the Paris Agreement, a task force was, complete, was convened um, to provide recommendations for voluntary disclosure. Excuse me. Um, and what the TCFD came up with was um, recommendations to help and assist companies to um, disclose their climate change related risk. The most significant recommendation that came out of the TCFD was this recommendation around scenario planning and stress testing. Um, this is a well-established method for developing strategic plans that are more robust and flexible. And what they are requiring is for companies to look at a range of plausible climate change futures, your two degrees and your four degrees world, um, in a getting to a two degree world, the economic transition risks and the movement towards a low carbon economy will be a lot greater, um, greater risks, whereas the, the physical impact risks will be a lot lower. Because if we manage to get to a world below two degrees, there will be less physical impact on the world. But on the flip side of that, looking at a four degree economy, if business as usual, we carry on, there will be less economic transition risk but there will be much greater physical impact risk. So looking at those plausible scenarios and, and making robust assumptions for your uh, company within that. Um, and what we are seeing happen is that this is being picked up by banks, credit rating agencies. Moody's, for example, um, are focusing heavily now on this stress testing and scenario planning, but they're going back and looking at their own portfolios and their own credit ratings of how 
when those ratings were established, they didn't take into consideration climate change risks. So they're rerunning um, and using new algorithms which build that in and reassessing the uh, credit ratings. Recently, South Africa saw a reduction in its in its credit rating because of uh, it not having taken into account climate change risk or developing strategies to mitigate it. And obviously, with a reduction in um, credit rating, you are a riskier entity, entity, country, whatever, and therefore your cost of borrowing increases. And as I just briefly mentioned, the banks are following suit and going back through their own portfolios and reassessing where their potential risks and opportunities lie. Um, the next slide um, is an example of, of a Brazilian bank, Itau, which focuses on agricultural lending. Um, and they analyze their largest, largest agricultural loans in a way of all else being equal, what would the impacts of water scarcity on their clients' business be? And what would, that, what would be the impact of their clients' ability to continue to make money and pay back their facilities? Um, and as you can see, on uh, the, the table closest to you, there's a lot of minuses. Um, apart from number three, which we reckon must be the coffee plantation on the top of the hill, um, but the, the rest of the, the companies were significantly negatively affected by not adapting, not taking into account um, climate change risks. And we are seeing similar exercises being taken in Australia, following a piece of rather unfortunate shareholder um, activist litigation. Commonwealth Bank came out in the financial year, uh, 1718, with really strong scenario testing, um, planning, and a real sort of leader in, in Australia to doing so. And what they looked at was on a five by five grid all of their residential mortgages. So if you have a mortgage from Commonwealth Bank, your house is in that, in that um, map somewhere. And so they did a consolidated analysis over every home in their mortgage portfolio and ran their data through a big supercomputer um, in America, which showed their exposures to properties from climate change related risk and the purpose of doing this was then to say how can we differentially price those houses that are riskier less riskier or where people are taking steps to make their um their house sort of for example more energy efficient um in the uk they've seen an increase in the banks differentially pricing mortgages and you know the idea behind energy efficient homes is that if people have are saving money because their houses are more efficient and they're not having to pay the increased prices of energy they then are saving money that if if updates need to be done in their houses to mitigate climate change risks they have that money there and so they are a less risky um they are less risky and therefore those mortgages can be priced differentially um the potential impacts on the property market because of climate change could be significant and banks and insurance companies are starting to look at look at that rather closely and um, sorry the slide just before um is just highlighting how they did the scenario planning and stress testing again in financial year 19 but this year they looked at um the agricultural sector and the impact of climate change on farm profitability um, and as you can see, the three at the top are in the red and sort of worst case scenario without adaptation. But then the three at the bottom don't actually represent an increase in potential farm profitability if adaptation um, and mitigation steps are taken. And so the bank looks at that sort of information and looks at how to you know, price their finance. And as I briefly touched on before, um, insurance companies are also looking into this and taking it into, into account. Um, flood, flood modeling revisions by IAG are now causing their subsidiary brand of Coles Insurance to 
consider whether cease providing insurance cover to some homes in high risk locations. That obviously has wide reaching implications that if your house is very expensive to insure or potentially is uninsurable, somebody, a potential buyer, isn't going to be able to get a mortgage on that property. And that is um, could potentially have wide reaching impacts on the, the property market. I will just briefly now touch on the um, liability consequences, looking at those physical risks for your business, the economic transition risks for your business. If you're failing to adapt and adequately, your potential exposure to um, liability risks is a lot greater. There has been a big explosive increase really in climate change litigation um, across the world, um, Australia being no, um, no different um, litigation and administrative claims for local governments, local councils, individuals, businesses are all really um, taking off and the liability risks that you are exposed to because of the risks of climate change could be significant. One of the, the cases that um, is significant in Australia at the moment is this case against REST, um, where a, a man in his 20s is bringing a case against him to say, I'm not eligible to access my pension or my superannuation until a certain period of time in the future. And by not adequately taking into account climate change risks, you're putting at risk my um, my superannuation. That case is ongoing in the courts at the moment. Um, we recently have seen a huge increase in royal commissions, one being the Murray-Darling Basin report. This unfortunately didn't get as much playtime in the press um, as was warranted because it came out in the same week as the report of the Financial Services Royal Commission. Um, but what the what was the important and significant part of this the findings of the Royal Commission is is showing that you know not in in the court context as we are seeing separately but in a commission context the language around not taking climate change into consideration and not properly using the science um, has attracted huge huge um, scathing comments as I don't know how clear you can see, but um, the words such as the MDMA demonstrated ongoing, ongoing negligence. There was a dereliction of its duties. Um, politics rather than science were driving these things. And the recognition by commissioners and the courts that now these things are requirements and not taking them into account can lead to, to um, increased liability. As I touched on really briefly, the, um, our corporate regulators are also taking this into consideration, as are the um, Australian Accounting Standards Board and Auditing and Assurance Standards Board released a joint practice statement saying that, that what one of their main areas of focus going forwards is going to be when a company, a company that's eligible for audit is relying on assumptions how reasonable are those assumptions and is it you know adequate and fair to take take on those assumptions and for the auditors just to accept those as being being correct but it now is squarely saying to the auditors that there is a responsibility to test those assumptions and push to show that they are reasonable and so now with the time left it's time to talk about the good news opportunities um, in finance. There's a lot of doom and gloom and worry around climate change and legal and financial risks of doing so. But on the flip side of that, there are some really great financial opportunities. Um, banks, as we discussed before, are beginning to think about the pricing of risks and opportunities. And there are lots of green bonds and sustainable finance, green finance link loans. Um, you know, if you are as a company, as a small business, as an individual seen to be managing your risks, you are less risky and therefore that can be priced in your favor. Um, we've seen a big increase in the offering of de debt instruments linked to sustainability. Um, 
in addition to the huge growth in green bond issues in recent years, FY19 has seen a consolidation of the emerging market for sustainability tied margin adjustment um, that are now being negotiated into um, credit facilities. We've made, there's been a huge increase in the EU and Asia and the US, but now um, these are starting to come through in Australia. A green loan is a loan where the purpose of the loan has to be identified for the use of green products, whereas a um, product incentive facility is any sort of corporate loan that can be used for any um, type of facility, but there are the options to negotiate those sustainable sustainability-linked margins. So it's quite low-hanging fruit if you're... Or, already using debt as a financial instrument, you can use it to your advantage and negotiate um, sustainability link things that you're already doing. Um, uh, so they can just be used for whatever you like. The example that I have, um, or some of the examples that I have, excuse me, they aren't, you know, enormous um, benefits, but they, they, can, they can be used to leverage your position. Um, for example, a Spanish comp company um, who they uh, transmission, distribution, sale and retail of electricity internationally um, negotiated with their, their bank a rate of, uh, of a KPI, KPI of about plus or minus 2.5 um, points linked to the achievement of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, targets and although that doesn't sound like a lot if it is a big facility over a long period of time that can actually have a relatively significant um impact recently australia saw its first you know large scale sustainability linked loans in relation to the sydney airport syndicated facility and also um queensland um syndicated facility and they so they have their loans linked to meeting certain targets and if those targets are met there's an adjustment down. But on the flip side of that, if those targets are not reached, then there is an adjustment up. So there's lots of incentive to, to meet those. Um, just having a quick look at the margin adjustment trigger examples. Uh, Renewi is a European waste management company. They have a, a million pounds um, facility and they have some incentives, which are the capture of fugitive methane converting their diesel trucks into renewable energy vehicles and also improving their three-day accident rate. And if those things are met each year, there's an adjustment up or down. Um, as this area continues to grow and Australia follows on from the rest of the world, there are huge opportunities in, in this area. I attended a, um, a conference in Perth a couple of months ago and a they had some farmers talking about their own personal um, use of, of financial instruments for their gain. And there was a really interesting um, example of hedging, using the, the financial concept of essentially hedging your bets, which has generally only been used in the financial markets for hedging with the insurance company. If this year was going to be a good year, then great. The, 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 the insurance premium would go up. But then if it was a bad year, the the insurance would pay out the same the, the same amount. And so that's sort of hedging over the years. So if, if you're in a good year or a bad year, financially you will be stable, which um, allows for sort of continuity planning and planning in the future. Um, um, Charlotte, sorry, I might... Yes. But in there, just give you a, a one minute warning, if that's all right. Just we're just running over time a bit. No worries. I've just got to my last bit. So it says, what does this Great. mean? Excellent. Um, so to minimise any potential liability, you need to mainly be thinking about how robust your assumptions, how robust your assumptions are. And um, the guidance that I briefly touched on before um, sets out some really great um, uh, ways and how you can do that. The the annexes at the back, which is on the next slide, um, set out some really clear user friendly examples of how to categorize your climate change risk and how would how best to to disclose it. Um, the next slide I have is just an example of how Melbourne Water did a really great um, scenario stress testing 
um, planning. And I just, I'll just wrap up very quickly with um, that. Even though there's lots of negatives and scary and and liability risks, there are lots of really great opportunities. And minimising the risks and capturing those can really help you not sustain businesses and your own finances, but but elevate them. Um, and yeah, given the time constraints, I'll wrap up there. Thanks very much, Charlotte. No worries. You've done well. That was a really um, very clear presentation. You're obviously struggling a bit with um, a cold, so we could. It's hay fever, okay. unfortunately. Oh, I was wondering whether it was <laughs> right. that. I might just quickly ask Peter and Graham to come up on the stage. We've actually um, we should be able to have a, a quick panel session before morning tea, um, and. Charlotte, you'll just be looming over the top of them on the screen, but that's okay. <laughs> okay. Up we go. So we've got we've got some roving mics. If you, do you want to have a seat, maybe so then um, if that works, and share the um, mic. If anyone's got any questions they'd like to ask any of the um, speakers today. Please just um, use the microphones available if you can, because then um, Charlotte will be able to hear you. There's just one up at the back, Dan. Thank you. Uh, Maria Riedel from Mildura. Um, Charlotte, a question for you. Um, the Ricks Creek Continuation Project was approved by the New South Wales Independent Planning Commission, which is a coal mine. And uh, this is after the refusal of the Bailong um, Coal Project in terms of scope three emissions, who's responsible for the emissions, the end user or the, the person who digs up the coal. What do you think of that, the two different rulings? It's really difficult, especially because we do see like inconsistent and and different judgments um, as this area sort of develops. Um, it's difficult to comment on which is right or wrong. They're both judgments. Um, I think as time progresses, there'll be more uniform uh, approaches within the court, and as more legislation and policies are introduced, it will make these things a lot clearer. Um, but as for um, situations like this, it's it's difficult to know why different judgments are being being handed down. That's not a particularly clear, helpful answer, but it's it's a, a um, an emerging area where we are seeing lots of variety and. Um, until we've got clearer legislation and policy, it's going to be difficult to navigate. Just hang on a minute. Charlotte won't be able to hear you until you've got the microphone. The concern is when states actually <coughs> change the laws to allow the, the, um, to not consider the emissions that are produced when coal is burned overseas. So it's actually the law is regressive. You know, so New mm. South Wales is, is, is regressing. Yeah. Does anyone have another question up the side there? Yeah, good morning. Matthew Pryor from Actendic. Charlotte, I was interested in your <clears throat> observation about the, I think the ruling you said in 2016, updated in 2019 about directors' um, legal responsibilities to consider impact of climate change, to, to what extent um, would those similar legal obligations apply to our elected officials? So that um, it wasn't a judgment. The It was an opinion. In, a, a QC was instructed to give an opinion on, on what he thought. Um, and it is widely considered that those some of those opinions about directors will um, also apply within within um, sort of the obligations in local governments and councils in that taking those you know they are statutory bodies that have to report in similar ways and, and that they will also apply. Hi. 
Hi, I've got a question for Charlotte as well. Um, Alexander from Coco. I was just wondering, when do you think sort of banks will start getting, giving these green loans to farmers and other small businesses? What, um, and it's more coming from speaking to other farmers and going to other conferences, is that is that where they're not being widely advertised, if you are going in and speaking to your financial managers and to your banks, they are prepared to negotiate terms and enter into these facilities with you and for themselves as well, because they have a responsibility to to manage their own portfolios in a in a way that deals with climate change that they want to be able to say, oh, look, good news story. We, we've got this facility and and um, it's linked to climate change and sustainability. So from their own inward looking, it, it benefits them. So the the sort of talk around is that if, if you're going in and approaching the banks, they're actually quite open to discussing these. Yep, one more. Just a comment on that last one. Um, Ewan from Sustainability Victoria, we've got some links to sustainable finance on our website and there's a session I'm running at two o'clock um, with those links to the products. Excellent, do we have any other questions? There's one right up the back. And that might, I think, be our final one so we can go and have a coffee. Um, my question is for Graham, actually. Um, we heard from Gabrielle Chan this morning that communities need to ask for the policies they want and not wait for things to happen because governments quite often are on the back foot. So as a, someone with so much expertise in climate change science and, and policy, I'm just wondering what you would suggest communities might or should ask for, what's that list in your bottom drawer of the things that really should happen that are not happening in terms of policy that you think would be great and most effective in terms of assisting farmers to deal with climate change going forward? What would you recommend? Yeah, great question. And I guess that is the key question is, is asking because there's this, you know, uh, you're, your local members and, and even with the with our staff, if, the more you ask for stuff, the more services and responses can be built around it. So that's really important. And I know there's a lot of people that, you know, aren't here today and who aren't able to talk about climate change or, or it's a bit too much for them at the moment. Um, but society doesn't wait for, you know, we've never waited for 100% acceptance of any particular issue before we've got on and done stuff. So there's more than enough people that want to get stuff done and there's good ideas and things we can do today we're trying to work out how we fast track them and like Rod I said across whether it's the old energy transition um, it's from water um, you know improved water infrastructure all of those sort of services we know we've got a lot of that, that there's a rich list of things there but the key bit is actually asking and people sort of not just being spectators and reading what's happening in the media and being a bit sort of um, you know, frustrated. It's getting up and doing something because there's so much actually happening, and the, the the really there is some big shifts. And with Charlotte's talk, you know, the, from ten years ago, the big shift is what's happening elsewhere with the flow of money and key decisions that are happening. And I think sometimes in rural areas, people are thinking are missing on some of that. There's a lot going on. There's lots of opportunity. Um, and there's a lot of risks of being sort of misplaced with that. There's a lot of investments happening in agriculture right now, and these are people that are purely across the climate stuff. And so I think part of it is, you know, making sure that each region's got the information and services they need to, to make those decisions. Because all of us, what we want is just making decisions today that leave us better off in future. And climate change is a part of that, but it's about how we build, build, you know, build things better, better services for what we need. One last question, I think. Tom Nicholas, Healthy Soils Australia. When are we got to, going to stop farting around the edges? The elephant in the room for that question that was asked is soil carbon. That underpins more photosynthesis and that cools the planet. That's what we've got to do. When are we going to do it? That's the question. And all we've got to do is incentivise the farmers and the land managers to start putting the carbon back in the soil. So we pay them to do it. Simple as that.
Peter, did you want to make a comment on that since no one's asked you a question? Yeah, she'd love to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think we take this as a comment. Um, <laughs> I, I think that's a better discussion to have one on one. Yes, there's many benefits of soil carbon. I do think we need to be cautious about single solutions to a really complex problem and soil carbon's part of that but I think there's that one of the aspects about climate change is it touches so many so many different aspects both in terms of adaptation and greenhouse gas reduction and we um, uh, I think for in terms of um, where we go with this um, I liked Gabriel Chan's um, uh, idea of the, um, the, uh, the, the, the guide for this planet comes from a thousands of little local plants. And I think that, that's the way we need to think about this I, and be cautious about slogans that go for one solution. That said, increasing soil carbon is a really beneficial thing to do with many wins and there are some other aspects as well. Thank you, Peter. I knew you were the right person to ask that, uh, to answer to respond to that because I think that is a beautiful um, segue into our next session, which is very much around um, ex giving examples of regional communities and regional businesses who have responded to um, the challenges that we face. So um, I've got some gifts for to hand to Peter and Graham. Charlotte, yours is in the mail. <laughs> no, it Thank really you. is. <laughs> um, and I would like to thank, um, ask you all to thank again our speakers. I think it's been really interesting to see, um, like I said, perhaps for those of us in, the, in, in farming, some speakers that, that some of us would have heard before, um, but someone quite different has, has really um, solicited a lot of interest in the room, judging from the number of questions we've had. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. And please help yourselves to... Um, Morning tea. Um, we'll have you back here by five past eleven, if that's okay. <laughs>